All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC show. We apologize for running a little bit late. We were having some technical difficulties. We want to make sure that you had the best presentation we could possibly give for you. So we keep talking about changes in our industry. We talk about new technologies. We talk about a lot of things that are happening in the residential sector, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about the commercial and industrial side, and we really should. We do have programs that have chillers and have industrial applications. So what is changing in the rest of the world as well? Well, everyone is being impacted in some way or another. So it's important to just talk about the technologies and talk about things that are coming just to be aware of changes in our industry and also to further our education with the things that we already have available to us. So we're spending some time today with Daikin, Daikin Applied. How are you guys doing? Hey, Good. how's it going? Good. So just to get familiar with some resources that we have available and to give you opportunities to learn more about, especially in the chillers. So we get you know, questions about chillers. We've seen a lot of young technicians that are now becoming students in our programs. You know, COVID really had an impact on the educational program. It forced yes, a lot it of people to retire early, didn't it? I mean, we've yeah. seen that quite a bit. So we have a lot of young educators coming into these programs that may not be as experienced with some of the larger products as you know we would hope for, even myself. So I spent a lot of time in the refrigeration and air conditioning building automations. I personally didn't spend a lot of time on high capacity chillers. I spent a lot of time on smaller capacities, 20 ton and under, especially chillers that were used for industrial cutting lasers on so little 134 and 404 systems. Mm -hmm. So when we get into our larger chillers in particular, it's good to have a fundamental understanding of how they're operating and where the resources are for getting training on those. So guys, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit and let the world know a little bit more about Dyke and Apply, because a lot of people know Dyke, but they may not know the applied side and what the applied side does for Dyke. Awesome. Awesome. Tom, go ahead and you, I'll let you introduce yourself first. Okay. My name's Tom Dickinson. I'm a senior HVAC instructor for Dyke. I uh, do the a lot of the sales side training for our new graduate engineering that comes into the business. Nice. I've been in the industry about 37 years. I was a controls technician starting out with a large company and then uh, became an application engineer and did many, many years with application engineers and then got into training and then came on board with Daikin about five years ago. And like I said, I've been mostly teaching on the sales, the sales side on the graduate engineering uh, transformation program. So you've seen yeah, a lot in controls. <laughs> yes, yeah. lots in controls. And, and that's one key part that I got with why I'm in the GET program or I'm mm -hmm. in there is because is I know how the whole building goes together. Right. I'm, not, I'm not focused on one piece of equipment. I know how the chillers, the air handlers all tie together, VAV boxes, fan coils, unit ventilators, all that stuff ties together. So that's where they use my expertise on that program. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and, and Tom does a great job with these recent graduates, the graduates that are coming out of engineering in multiple areas, different universities, and then we teach them and train them up both on industry knowledge, technical knowledge, and also on you specifics around our equipment and selection of our equipment and how it applies. It's a really great program we have at Dyke and Learning. So I'm Trey Hogue, and I've been in the industry for about 22 years. I, I started out as a technician in a van, 10 years fixing equipment. Didn't actually do a lot of work on on large tonnage equipment. I was kind of like, you know, I mean, I saw a roof pack here. I saw, right. you know, one, maybe two chillers, but we're talking 50 tons, you yeah. know. Small fry. Uh, small stuff. In, in the to, big you know, grand scheme of things. Yeah, in the, yeah exactly. Yeah, same here. Exactly. Came to work for Dyke and in 2011 in their technical response center as an analyst. And since then, I've held uh, three or four different positions with them now working as uh, what we call learning ops or learning operations. Sure. Deployment of training. Basically, you know, Tom and, and I work on deploying training. We deploy training year round in some form, some way, whether that's online in a learning pathway, in person or virtual instructor led training, whatever that might be. We're associated we're very closely to that deployment. There's a big team that makes it happen, though. And so yeah, you, know, you have physical facilities as well as online training. We do. We do. We have uh, we have online training. We have self-directed online training. We have entire programs around industry training as far as like foundations, refrigeration, electrical, air side, chillers, chiller plant design, and, and which includes optimization and how you you optimize a plant. And a lot of that controls theory uh, is associated with it. Tom actually sure. is one of the main instructors and a lead, a course lead on 
that program specifically among everything else that he does. So he's fantastic. Great. Yeah. Well, in fact, we have a class running next week in Stanton with I think 22 people on, on chillers on, on uh, the chiller product line. Yeah. Excellent. Chiller product line. So Daikin applied, you asked that question. Everybody's yeah. not heard of Daikin. Yeah. Daikin, right. the, uh, so Daikin industries limited, which is our parent company. They are the largest manufacturer of HVAC equipment in the world, headquartered out of, of Japan and with offices and factories and manufacturing, you know, all over the world, but we are Daikin applied Americas. And so Basically, when you get into the applied market, basically we're talking about those specific applications where equipment is 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 in a building. We're talking large tonnage chillers, industrial equipment, process cooling, chiller plants, uh, centralized plants. We make uh, equipment uh, all the way. I think our smallest chiller, if you go on the air side, is actually mm-hmm. down to a ten to fifteen ton. Yeah, I've that's seen some one of those. Of, yeah, the small KW chillers. But when you go all the way up to the water side, we're manufacturing 3,000 tons wow. um, and, and larger, 3,000 tons in a magnetic chiller. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about that once we get there. That's, that's some pretty yeah. interesting technology. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really cool place to work. Any background in HVAC, or even if you don't, there's always opportunities in this industry. And it's a great way to pay. I mean, that's what we're doing right now is paying it forward for all those people. That are coming in so Absolutely. appreciate the opportunity to be here now i'm glad you guys are here it helps paint that bigger picture you know i did a uh, did a podcast when we were at the hvacr excellence conference where we were discussing the the perception of hvac and refrigeration because a lot of people don't see that side of it and if we talk mm-hmm. about a three thousand ton chiller i mean how many people have ever actually seen one you know very few people have ever went to look for one and once you see them you go oh my gosh everyone should see these kind of things they don't realize yeah. that it is a progression within our industry so if we spend time in air conditioning we spend time in refrigeration we start looking at those other plateaus you know because we all get to plateaus in our industry where we're looking for that next step what do i do i've been working on this for a while man i'd really like to check out some of this big stuff but how do i do that what are my mm-hmm. paths so this is a path to be able to get into it that is. field yeah so, so and and it's it's and it's a very lucrative path oh, for yeah. even at the technician level. Sure. So just putting it out there because we need more <laughs> high quality technicians coming yeah. into the field. Sure. So all right. Yeah. Well, Tom, let's dive a little bit into chillers. Let's do some just basic foundational work so we get an idea of what we're talking about. So I'm a I'm a technician. I have came through school. I've got my graphs of basic refrigeration, basic electrical troubleshooting. I've been working on air conditioning. I'm ready to step up the game and move into some higher capacity systems. What do they even look like? Okay. What are the options? So what we're going to do, uh, what I'll start out with, is we, we've done the instruction here, but um, what I want to do is just take a real basic system. But then there are a couple of things I want to talk about before we get starting on how this system is laid out. There's a couple of things you have to know about chillers. There's all sorts of different types of chillers, all different sizes, and that's because of all the different types of applications that we may need to use it for. But a couple of things you need to know about is there are such, such chillers that are called full load efficiency chillers, okay. which mean that they run at full speed, and that's when they're the most efficient. And then the new technology that has been coming out over the last uh, 14, 15, maybe 16 years is what we have now is part load efficiency. That's where we sure. get into our magnetic bearing variable speed drives, where on those p- part load efficiency chillers, they can turn down and go slower and go at a lower load without coming off the pad. Where on some of the older chillers that are full load, if they get down to a, below a certain percentage on their load, they will start groaning and moaning because they don't they can't run at that level absolutely so you will be talking when i'm showing you these slides i'll be talking about part load and then full load chillers because okay. we we intermix them because you can use them uh, to help your your efficiency out in your building okay the other thing i want to talk about when i talk about va vfds vfds the key to the vfds is is that if you can get that that motor down below 80 percent you're saving 49% energy usage on that motor. That's a big drop. It's a big drop, and it, and it yeah, and, and you drop it down below that 80%, or you keep those those uh, VFDs below 80%. You're saving money all the time. That's sure. why if we have if we have two 
chillers together, a, a full load and a part load. We may run the part load until it gets up to about 80%, then bring on the full load where it runs sure. efficiently and let that, that part load back off. So Makes when sense. I talk about it in here, you'll see where I say it, then you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. And then the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is temperature range. Temperature range. When I talk about temperature range, I'm talking about these coils here. These coils all have temperature ranges. Depending and on their most, locations. Yeah, the location yeah. and mostly in the buildings. They'll say, I have a building, a brand new building here. My coils, all my coils have been designed with a 10 degree temperature range. Mm -hmm. So that means that 44 degree water in, 54 degree water out. So the okay. water water temperature differential. Yes, yeah. it's, okay. it's what we're going to use. So if the, the coil is at 100% and, and running efficiently, mm -hmm. we're getting uh, 44 in and 54 is coming out. And that's key because we got something that I'll talk about a little later about low delta T where we're putting 44 in and we're getting 50 out. And right. now we're getting into a low delta T situation. But right. I just want to talk. Yeah, I want to talk about that temperature range. And when I get to that point, that temperature range is the range you're building set up for. And you have to watch out sometimes when you're putting in uh, some a new building and maybe tying that chiller onto an older On an building. existing system, yeah. What's their temperature range? Because in the sure. old and some of the older buildings, they got 14 degree temperature ranges. Sure. And that will cause a problem for your chiller down the line. Yeah, okay. Tom, on that, you, you mentioned those coils. For the audience that's mostly worked on one uh, residential and or light commercial, you know, you're, we're talking about the difference between an air to refrigerant exchange and an air to water exchange. Right. He's, he's specifically talking about water heat exchangers. Yep. So these are water. When we're talking about that Delta T or Delta temperature across that coil, it's that water flow through that coil and how much heat that water is picking up from the air that's going across it. And so just to make sure that your audience understands oh, yeah. these are water coils. These right. are not what you see. It's not an A coil in a residential unit. It's not refrigerant going through it. It's water going through it and air being blown across and heat transferring into the water. Yes. So I'm, you probably, I don't, I hope I didn't get ahead of you on that. Time. No, 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 that's fine. That's perfect. I just, I just want to kind of baseline it so that as yeah. we're going through here, I'm not, saying something that you know maybe might be confusing or anything like that sure. and if it is i'll i'll uh, trey you catch me and and raise it and let me know but we're going to start out with a very basic system this is a very basic system this is an older system you don't see many of these anymore because of the energy that uh, the that it takes to run this kind of a system is, sure. is a little bit higher than what we expected today's but this is a constant flow single chiller so what i mean by constant flow is these pumps right here run at their constant speed they just 100%. run yep 100 percent. just run through this and depending on this chiller it's 800 ton chiller usually it's 2.4 gallons per ton you can multiply that out and that gets you your 2400 tons of uh i think it's 2400 tons uh through the through the system but what i'm getting at is it's constant flow so what happens when it's constant flow we have to have three-way valves because if all of a sudden a coil down here, the room gets satisfied. Changes its load. Yeah, the coil's yeah. going to, the, the valve's going to go closed. And then all of a sudden our pump pressure is going to be higher and we're going to be pumping. We're going to all start deadheading that pump. So what we do is we have three-way valves here. And then as the coils start getting closer to their set point, instead of taking in the full amount of water through the coil, it starts bypassing, bypassing. some of the water to the return. Sure. Now, this is great. It worked perfect back in those days, but nowadays that's going to start putting colder water back to our chiller and it's going to start causing our chiller to start to react to saying, hey, I'm pumping out 44, but I'm getting 50 degree water back. What's going on here? Sure, and then absolutely. it's it's going to start surging and start coming off its pad, you know, grumbling and all that stuff. So that that you don't see that unit out there that much or that type of, of uh, system out there that much. A lot of people have taken these and made the and blocked these valves off and made them two ways and gone through that and what they've done is they've gone to something that looks like this uh this excuse me this is constant flow also with parallel chillers so we're giving it some stages so we're basically if we're comparing it to an air conditioning system we're going from a single stage into a two stage exactly we're, we're just and changing notice, the load capacity and notice the loads are out to the same out there in the field but what we did was we took that 
800 ton chiller we had in the first screen mm -hmm. we divide it up into two, two 400 two. sure now this is perfect in the old in the days they they would run these and it would be great but they wouldn't put isolation valves in here because of the cost well well after a while they realized that hey if i'm not running this chiller here i got to isolate this thing or what's going to happen is i'm going to pump warm water through this chiller here and it's going to cool it down but then warm water is going to come through here and mix and with this water through. Sure. Right. And then what happens is we get warmer water out in the space. Mm -hmm. We might not be dehumidifying and it starts to get a little sticky out there. So what they did with these systems here was they went ahead and put isolation valves on the chiller that's not running. Okay. And hey, Tom, before you go any further, I, I do want to mention 95% of the issues that we see from a technician's perspective with the field is not actually related to the equipment itself. It's related to how the system is being operating okay. operate, and the application that the particular type of equipment is being applied. So meaning a piece of equipment, because it's applied work, it's, it's because every piece of equipment that runs, I mean, honestly, we, we don't have, we, we do stock chillers out here in the back lot, but every piece of equipment that has come down the line out here in manufacturing, which is where I'm housed at actually is designed for, for a specific application. If that chiller that's designed for that application is then misapplied, we have problems. Sure. If the system is not being controlled in the way it's supposed to, in order the way the application is, we have problems. And that's when Tom will talk about like that, even that low Delta T. Right. What I want people to understand is that the first thing to understanding chillers is understanding systems right as a complete system putting yeah, all the components is, together it is not flange building to flange. a big picture not flange to flange you can't right. look at it flange to flange and so sorry to interrupt tom no no I that's felt fine like people are this particular audience should know that there's there's so much to a system you can solve a problem just by truly understanding the system all yeah the and and when i do my classes we break it up into three sections first it's the field out here from you can draw a line like right oops sorry sorry about that click the button you can draw a line straight down through here mm -hmm. this is one section that we look for if there's any problems the second one would be the chillers themselves are we getting the right around right amount of water through them what's going on here the third one which is a big one which a lot of people forget about is those cooling towers sure if absolutely. those cooling towers are not doing their job then it will make the chiller look bad so when I do uh, any kind of troubleshooting or anything uh, training wise, I always tell them, hey, you got to think about this in three sections. Are you getting the right water back from the field, from the, the, the building? Is it being the right water going out? You know, is the chillers doing their job? And then what is the cooling tower doing? Is the cooling tower providing us with the right amount of water? I mean, uh, are, and, the, and the right temperature water. If it's cool outside, I don't want that water coming back to the chiller at 85 degrees, even mm. though that's the ASHRAE standard. I want it to be lower so it's that cool, I get some good. condenser water relief. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and this is not just our chillers that I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, this oh, no, is this general is, chiller philosophy. Yes, yes, just, yes. Systems touch everybody's, no matter what manufacturer you are. Right. Okay, so then another thing that we've done, and the, you don't see these very often, but I thought I'd bring them up just in case somebody says, hey, you know, you never talked about these, but yeah. this is series, series chillers. System. Sure. This is so that we cascade them mm -hmm. and you can get a little bit of, uh, of a, a, an advantage out of them. And these are usually used where you need, you got high lift systems or you have some really, really, uh, uh, you know, large systems. This might be like a district cooling plant or something where they're going to bring water in here. They'll run it through this chiller. And what I did was I kind of showed these bars here. This chiller's job is only to take the return water and take it from like maybe 54 degrees and get it down to 48 degrees. And then it gives it to this chiller, and this chiller takes it from 48 down to 44. Okay. So they're they're kind of sharing the load and going through there. The key is, is this this chiller right here, the lag chiller, is going to do most of the work because it's got it's taken the temperature down six degrees where this guy here is, is only going to take it down about four degrees makes sense right so what it does is it cascades them now you don't see these very often the ones that you see the most of is this one right here this is the same thing series chiller but it's what we call series counterflow 
And what it does is it does the exact same thing chiller wise. It still takes the water and it goes through the lag first. Then it goes through the lead chiller and goes out. Okay. But what we're doing is we're taking the cooling tower and running it through the system backwards or counter flow. So what happens is, is that we're lowering the lift. This guy doesn't have to have his high lift because it doesn't, it's only getting, you know, it's, it's getting the temperature down to about 49 degrees. Okay. So you can see over here, it doesn't have a real big lift. It's got 81 is the, the PSI uh, lift. And then on this guy here, we only have a 74 PSI lift. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea, 81, 74. But when you go back to the previous slide, notice it's 81 and 86. Oh, okay. So that little lift, people don't realize, that little lift means that, com that compressor has got to work that much harder to get up to that temperature. Sure. So what happens is that's more energy, more work that that chiller has got to do, and it doesn't save you a ton of money. I mean, it's, it does. It saves you money because you got to be in cascade. But it doesn't save you much operating. as we as we do the counter flow. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but, no, that makes sense. But you got to keep an eye on it. You got to balance it out because you're going to have to have a larger condenser pump because you're running one condenser pump for both chillers. Sure. And every time that you run one chiller, you're going to run that one condenser pump. So you have to balance it out. But over the long run, these are used. Uh, we have one plant over in uh, the Middle East that has this kind of thing set up here. There's 24 of these set up like this. Really? Yeah, so, it's, it's quite the sight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that and would it, be interesting. And, and it produces the water and gets it down there. So, so this is this is like I said, this is a series counterflow chiller. That it's just that the condenser water is counterflowing through yeah. there, so that the chiller that has to produce the coldest water also gets the coldest condenser water. Hmm. And Tom, Tom, is is that the central plant that they actually sell? chilled water as a utility yes, yes. it goes all over, yeah, it Absolutely. goes all around yep yeah yep so anyway that's that's the that's like i said that we showed the constant flow this is the series these are constant flows so this is constant flow too but this is a series counter flow chiller hmm. now this is the one that you're going to see a lot of because yeah. they're out there they're they're we're a moving redundancy. to redundancy yeah we're moving to a new technology but this is still a lot of them there out there. This is what we call a primary secondary system. And you can draw a line right about right here, right across here. This is the primary system. And at these pumps right here, this is the secondary system. So what happens is, is on this slide I have here, each chiller has a dedicated pump to it. So when you bring on a chiller, that pump will come on. So the chiller will control that pump. So when I call for chiller one to turn on, it'll turn on its pump. Chiller two, chiller three, chiller four. The golden rule here is on any primary secondary system, the primary pumping system, the primary system needs to pump at least the equal or greater than what the secondary is pumping. So if my, I'm pumping 720 gallons out right now on this primary loop, my secondary loop or excuse me, my primary loop, uh, is pumping 643 gallons out. It can pump up to 960, but it's only pumping 643 gallons out to the space. So I'm exceeding that, and that's good because that means I only have 40, I mean, 77 degree water or 77 gallons of water going through the decoupler oh, being okay. pulled back through here. Bypassed around it. Yeah, sure. the decoupler loop, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. The decoupler loop, all it does is separates the primary pumps from the secondary pumps. Hmm. So the secondary pumps, if they need water, if for some reason, let's say these guys aren't pumping enough water, then what happens is instead of them trying to pull water out of the chiller and, and suck the chiller dry, it will pull water down this decoupler loop and send it back out to the field. Makes sense. And if the primary is pumping more, which it is right now, it's pulling some of the water off this primary header here and sending it back to the chillers. Sure. It's like a pressure balance. And we try yeah. to keep that at a very minimum. A lot of times, it doesn't show it on here, but a lot of times, uh, I, had, I had a large, large pharmaceutical I worked at. I engineered the plant. We had a, uh, I, oops, sorry. Got to stop clicking. Uh, we had a uh, bi-directional flow meter here. 
and the flow meter will watch the water through there. And if it gets up to a certain point going in one direction, it will tell the operator to shut off a chiller. If it's going the opposite direction to a certain point, it'll say, hey, you need to start a chiller. And stage up. Yeah, and so sure. it would let them know so that they try to keep the water going through that decoupler at a minimum amount of water. Hmm, if it gets good. too high, then we start losing our energy that we, we we're starting to push water back in that we've already cooled down. Yeah, absolutely. And notice on this one, since this is a variable primary, this primary is variable speed, we've gotten rid of the three-way valves, and we have just two ways in there. Because as the two ways close down, then the the pumps will start closing off Compensate and slowing that down. Flow. Yes. Sure. And I'll show you that here in a minute, how that all works. But the nice thing about these is, is that that 10 degree range, mm -hmm. we stay at 10 degree range because even though the room might get satisfied, all we're doing is restricting the water flow through the coil. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we always stay at about a 10 degree return on these unless something goes wrong in the field, like a dirty coil or somebody's got a valve pipe, pipe backwards or somebody's done something. So if all of a sudden I get on one of these units and I got low delta T here, I got to check out here in the field and find out what's going on because it shouldn't be come back low delta T. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, that's what we we're talking about earlier. I mean, there's, it's a balance. Yep. In a system, it has to, you know, that, that chiller is selected for that system. That system is built for that chiller. It is a balance. There's no, uh, th there's less play. Don't get me wrong. There's always ways of looking at how do I reconfigure this and how do I control this differently. But what I can tell you is controls and how you do this is very, very important. Yeah. You can't pull one pump out and put in another one just because you have one of similar size and well, not knowing well, exactly what the flow rate is. And you, you can't start one pump um, on the other chiller without thinking about what that's going to do to the that operating chiller flow. that already, yeah. you know, and in this case, you have a pump for each chiller, but if you had a common pump, you know, you would need to, to speed that pump up in order to maintain your flow to, to start a second chiller. So go I'll ahead, Tom. I'll right. show you that next. Well, the one thing I do want to mention is if for some reason this chiller right here uh, decide, went, went bad on us or we had to remove it or we, had to, we got rid of it or something like that, we've seen some customers come in and put a variable speed drive uh, 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 a magnetic bearing speed uh, right. a magnetic, magnetic bearing in here they'll put it in here as a original chiller and then what they'll do is they'll take this decoupler loop and move it down here to the end because that variable speed will handle that cold water coming back okay. better than these three will gotcha so you'll you'll see some of that but that's just a little thing but now here's one that trey was just talking about this is a same thing primary secondary system no different it's just that we have the pumps are now headered and we have an N1, or a, what we call a spare pump. So you can see I have five pumps here, four chillers. But any one pump can be turned on with any one chiller. So if I wanted to start this pump with this chiller, all I need to do is open up the valves and pop water through that chiller. One of the questions that just came in, are any of those uh -huh. pumps VFD drive or are they... Not on straight this one, pump. no. Okay. They're just straight Thanks, constant Matt. speed. Yes. Any, yeah, anytime you see this little guy right here. Oops, sorry. I did it again. Sorry. Uh, anytime you see this right here, those are considered variable speed draw, uh, pumps. Okay. But these are constant speed pumps right now. Okay. And then I have isolation valves on each one. So when I'm only using two chillers, I'll isolate the other two, and I'll run these. And I got check valves in here so that if I got one pump running, it's not going to spin another pump backwards or anything. Yeah, well, so look, if you think about this, what does this do for you? This allows you to potentially have lead lag on your pumps. It also allows you to, uh, you know, be able to control that, that you know, specifically that lead lag, you know, starts versus run hours, right? Mm -hmm. Starts versus yep. big conversation, starts versus run hours. And how do you keep that balanced and make sure, sure that your pumps last as long as they're going to? So that gives you an option here where pump one could be running and pump four could be running or pump two could be running and pump five could be running for the same amount of load that the chillers are going to have to produce to go out to the building. Hmm. And, and plus it, you have that N one pump down at the end so that if any one pump fails, you have a backup uh, oh, in case you have to run that. all four, all yeah. four things. But this oh. is like I said, a primary secondary system operates no different than the one I showed you before. Sure. It's just that the pumps are headered. Okay. 
All right. This is what I'm going to tell you. On that secondary side, this is the way the secondary side works. Uh, I know this is an air-cooled chiller, but just pretend that's a, um, a water, tower. A water <laughs> cooler. But anyway, we have our pump, and our pump has a variable speed drive on it. Uh -huh. And then out at the end of our, our, our uh, system out here, you know, maybe in between the last and the, the, the very last coil, somewhere out there, two-thirds way down the line, somewhere there, we have a pressure differential sensor. That monitors because every time the water comes down through here, the pressure is going to start dropping because it's going through a coil. A restriction, so sure. Yep. So it's going to start dropping. So what we want to do is we want to see what the pressure is down here so that this pump can maintain a certain amount of head pressure right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it's, that's how that's, excuse me, let me back up. That's how this secondary system right here is operated. There's a DP out here and it operates these pumps to maintain the pressure out there. As these pumps speed up and slow down and use more or less water, then we will turn on and turn off chillers to meet that demand for these pumps. So it's still so, load based. Yes. Yeah. Still load based. Go ahead. It, Tom, does that does that pressure differential sensor play into, let's say, if we had a call on a building that, you know, we had a particular uh, coil, say, at the far end of the co of the system, not a room, a space that's not getting cold air, um, is that a pump issue, a pressure issue? What is that? Well, the, if it didn't wasn't getting cold air, then I uh, the thing that I would look at is a couple things. First off is is am i reading am i getting pressure down to the valve down there right then the second thing would be is the valve opening up or mm -hmm. is it jammed or is it stuck or did the diaphragm break or is if it's electric valve did the motor break and then the third thing i would check would be is the coil clean or is it been dirtied mm -hmm. okay because if it's dirty and we're not getting the amount of airflow across it then the room's going to get you know if it's if it's in the summertime, it's going to get hot. If it's in the wintertime, it's going to get cold because we're not getting the air across it. But those would be the first thing. I, I, I'd go to the computer and, and check the, the DP down there and see what the pressure is because it's going to show you or go to the controller and see what the if the pump is maintaining pressure out there in the space. If it's maintaining pressure out here, the differential pressure that we need, then the next thing would be is this valve opening up. And then the next thing would be, and, and also I check hand valves because you never know. Right, Somebody may go up there and say, bypassed. oh, I'm going to do something. And they, they close the hand valve and they forget to open it up. And then the next thing would be to check the coil to see if the coil is dirty or anything wrong with it. The other thing I would do, and this would be you know kind of strange, but has anybody been working on that coil? Because I've seen instances where somebody say, yeah, yeah, they replaced that coil and it's, it hasn't worked for us since. And then come to find out they got the valve in backwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, things like that you have to look right. at. But the key one, yeah, Trey, would be the first thing it is check to see that you have the pressure out here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is this decoupler. Now, I, I was mm -hmm. telling you about the decoupler as... Right is we need more water here, then the, we better start chillers up. If we get too much water coming from the primary system, we don't want to force it on these secondaries, so it'll go through here and back to the chillers. Okay, we don't want too much, but we want a, a little bit of it. So, you know, these things are very critical because, uh, you know, from, from the decoupler loop to the first chiller, you got to have at least a minimum of 10 pipe diameters you can't be real short. It's got to be, you know, 10 pipe diameters. And the same thing over here, that, that, that decoupler loop itself has to be at least three pipe diameters in length for it to work properly. Because what we're doing is we're bringing the water back through here off of velocity. Sure, So absolutely. as that return Makes water's sense. coming, that, that's where we draw it back into the system. So okay. that's the decoupler. Now, this here is just automatic. If we pump in too much, then it moves this way. If it's pumping too little, it goes that way. Over here, this is a way that we can also tell if we need to start another chiller or not. Now, I put in a, a uh, bi-directional uh, flow meter that told my operators what they needed to do. Some people use this, what they call a decoupler temp temperature bridge. They put in four sensors. And they monitor these four sensors. Oh, sure. And they make up an algorithm. So they look and they yep. say, hey, this is 54, 54. Okay, we're not passing. No water's coming back this way. And then we look at this. This is 44. But all of a sudden, this is 46. Then that means we got water coming back this way. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That makes so sense. Looks, 
Yep. It looks at a decode. It, 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 it's just programmed up so that it can say, hey, if these are the same and these are the same, hey, we're good. But if all of a sudden one of these is not reading properly, we may need to start a chiller or we may need to stop a chiller. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one question that did come in from uh -huh. Patrick Murphy was, could you possibly explain that three or ten pipe diameter rule? Yeah, what it is is, <coughs> excuse me, when you get in some mechanical rooms, it gets really tight in there. Sure. And from from the the main line, the the header, the header from coming out of the chiller, uh, and before it goes into the, or it goes into the secondary pumps, this this from here to where it ties into the return line, it has to be three pi pipe diameters in length. So if you have an eight inch pipe, eight inch diameter pipe, so you can take three, that pipe, that, that decoupler loop has to be at least 24 Minimum. inches long. Sure. Yep. Okay. Minimum. It could be longer, but it, it's got to be at least 24 inches long. And the same thing here from the chiller to where the decoupler ties into the return line, it's got to be 10. So if it's eight inches, it has to be at least 80 inches before it goes into the first chiller. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, there's one sense now. A university in P uh, Phoenix that we take the get students to, and it has a it has a, a short decoupler loop, but it meet it meet it met the minimum size because um, it it was it, it I think it was five diameters pipe length, so they they met the diameter, but it was really short. Real, real close. Yeah, it was really I was I was kind of because I couldn't well, see how I couldn't see the diameter of the pipe because it was sure. insulated. But the guy said, no, yeah, we met it by five. So, and, well, and it's, it's an important com conversation because, you know, let's be honest, like you said, mechanical rooms are cramped. Yep. Right. There's only so much room for pipe. Uh, depending upon the size of the chiller, the size of the load, the size of the building. I mean, I've been in mechanical rooms with 14 inch pipe, you know, and, you know, th there's not a lot of room there. Yep. You need to make sure that it was, uh, you know, to, you, that, that it, to, work, to work right, that everything's right. And by the way, there's additional upfront costs for every inch of steel that you got to install. Oh, yeah, think about that. Oh part. yeah, yeah. That's another thing. Maybe another class or something down the line when we mm -hmm. talk about chiller plant design. You know, that's one thing that we talk about. Is remember I was talking about that temperature range, ten degree temperature range. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to try and save money on piping and stuff like that, you know, that's why a lot of the big ones that do district cooling, where they're going on on a college campus or they're they're supplying chill water for a a, a town. They'll they'll run their range from 10 degrees up to 18 degrees, because if they can run that colder water and 18 degree range, it cuts their pipe size way down. Oh, okay, sure. Way down. I get but, that. Changes the we, velocity though, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 And it and it it just you just have that you don't need as much water mm -hmm. because you got a larger range. Okay. All right. So let me. Uh, over here now this one here is a variable primary flow this is a newer system they've been out for a little while uh but it's 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 newer than the other ones i've shown you this one here is notice we got rid of the secondary pumps they're gone so what happens is these primary pumps right here remember primaries pump through the chiller these pump pumps right here are sized and controlled off of a dp that's in the building so they will speed up and slow down depending on what is the load, what's going on inside the building. Huh. Okay. Okay. Now, they will speed up and slow down to a certain point. Uh, there's flow meters here, and these pumps will not go below right. the point? minimum flow that the chillers required. Gotcha. But with the newer chillers uh, that have been out for the last 15 years or so, minimum flow has gone you know, pretty low so that... You know, you, these these pumps can actually take care of if the building starts to, you know, the load when the building drops off, these pumps can still take care of keeping the chillers on and running. Which brings up a, a good point. As we're starting to get into, you know, VFD controlled compressors, what is that minimum capacity? Are they getting down to that, you know, 35, 30 percent that we see in a lot of our variable compressors in the refrigeration industry? So, so um, our, our magnetic chiller can actually turn down to 10 percent oh okay so um it's like running a window unit yeah on a 300 ton chiller right or, 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 or just you know so and again but now when i say it can turn down to 10 percent system is is so important in order to be able to make it so it right. can do that everything else would have to go that low as well 
Well, when we talk about condenser relief, he sure. mentioned condenser relief. You know, 85 degree water is going to force a centrifugal compressor to need to run in a specific envelope range to, door, right. to prevent it from surging. And for those that don't know what a surge is, a surge is when refrigerant reverses direction inside of the centrifugal uh, at the impeller. So you'll actually see it. It makes a horrible racket. Cavitates. You know, <laughs> but, but. It, the refrigerant actually, it gets to the point so where the centrifugal force cannot overcome the positive pressure on the discharge side. Yep, makes sense. And if that happens, then the refrigerant will stall first. And once it stalls, it is at risk of surge. Well, an impeller is not designed to be doing this the whole time. And you end up with all kinds of potential opportunity for damage. So gotcha. If we turn that chiller down and slow that speed way down in order to get it down to, say, running at a, a, a even you know, 10, 15, 20% of the actual designed capacity of the chiller, we're going to have to reduce the condenser water temperature in order to lower the envelope that the compressor can run in. Okay. And so it's important that when you're trying to get that kind of efficiency that you understand and control your system right i knew you guys were the right ones for this because this is where it begins getting critical when we start talking about efficiency we're not talking about it let's go out and turn some wrenches and see what happens we are really having to understand the entire operating system uh, mm -hmm. so you know variable capacity is great but what are the other key components in variable capacity so this is great i'm, I'm glad we're touching this yeah. topic yeah. yeah, so on this one here, what we're doing is we're just varying the primary. The primary is feeding the building, and it's watching the, the, the pressure in the building just like our primary secondary was doing, our secondary side was doing it. Uh, but what it does is it also keeps an eye on these chillers, and it makes sure that we have the water to go through uh, for minimum the minimum requirement. Minimum if, yeah. if we need minimum flow and we're not getting it back from here because of that, it will open up the bypass and pull huh. water in and, and get it through the chiller. Okay. The key is keeping the chillers uh, uh, running uh, so that it doesn't go on off of low flow. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We I, don't. We don't. We get a chiller started. We don't want to turn it off yeah, unless we no. have to. <laughs> no. Right. And so. Uh, so, so what we wanted, what we do here is we're we're getting rid of that secondary pumps and and just running off of some primary pumps that will they'll handle that. Well, let's briefly talk about that minimum water flow, just to make sure, sure people understand why there is a minimum. What happens once we get down to that minimum water flow through that chamber? Yep. So a um, minimum water flow is going to vary based on the, the chiller and how it's been designed and applied. Um, and so whenever we look at that minimum flow, it is a range. You know, the, the, or the, let, me, let me restate that. Flow is a range. There's a minimum. There's also a maximum. Right. All right. So when we do an actual selection on a chiller, we're going to look at what are those minimum maximums, what size pumps, what size impeller on the pumps, all that stuff. Right. But the importance of that minimum flow and not being under that minimum flow, first off, is, is that flow switch on that chiller is set to that minimum flow. It comes from the factory that way. Right. And if you go below minimum flow, you're going to potentially alarm out. And if you alarm out, it's going to shut down. In the case of our chillers, we might reset that alarm once or twice. If it doesn't, if, if the condition, we only reset it if the condition is, is changed and we'll only reset it if we think we can start. Once we get to three strikes, boom, you're out. Somebody's hmm. got to go push a button. There you go. So And find out why we had low flow. Right. And then find it. Yeah. And then exactly find out how we, why we had low flow. But the other thing is, is that if you look at this, let's just say this was a DX air cool. If I slow the fan speed down on an air handler across an air to refrigerant coil, like in a residential system, what's going to happen to my coil? Right? I'm yeah. changing the conditions that the pressure temperature of that refrigerant is operating in and could potentially, by the way, there's water going through That's here. That's right. <laughs> That's why I was leading to. <laughs> right? There's water going through here. What does water do when it drops below 32 degrees Fahrenheit? That's right. Now we start having potential for freezing. Yep. And all of that is, is is associated with how the chiller is 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 built, the amount of heat transfer, the number of tubes that's inside of it, the size of tubes that are inside of it, um, you know, and and again, the flow is balanced to what that chiller is supposed to output as far as capacity goes. So awesome, thank you, Tom. I don't know if I said it 
I, yeah. I know there are other things I'm, I'm sure not, that I could have mentioned, but I'm not a big chiller guy. But the easiest thing I've always thought about is if that flow goes low, you're not going to boil off a, enough refrigerant, and then this chiller is going to start surging on you. Yep. Yep. It's going to start surging because it's not going to have enough pressure to get it over into the condenser side. Yeah, and see, and in this case, as far as these chillers go, these are water cooled chillers. These are flooded evaporators. These aren't yep. DX evaporators. Right. We have DX evaporators on our air cooled stuff. But on these, uh, our water are flooded. So we're looking at about a uh, one, you know, one to two degree approach on the water. Yep. So if the water's leaving at, at 44, the refrigerant uh, uh, saturation temperature at one to two degrees of approach is like 42. Okay. And what, yeah. what Trey means by flooded means is this is a tube and shell. So the refrigerant's going through the the, or the going through the shell i'm sorry the refrigerant's going through the shell so it's sitting in there it's just a big like big like lake of refrigerant tank, yeah. refrigerant yeah and the water is going through the tubes so yep. as the water goes through the tubes it boils the refrigerant because it's the refrigerant's picking up the heat and then the vapors move to the top and go to the compressor yeah okay because I, I don't it was centrifugal scroll screw i don't care what you are we don't like to move liquid we got to yes. make sure that we That's got right. gas coming into the compressor. We are vapor pumps. Yeah. And that might be another module that we go through because I have one on yeah. chiller chiller types. Sure. Yeah. All the different types. That would be a good one. All right. So this is, like I said, this is variable primary flow. Now, uh, this one here is a newer one. They're testing it out. Uh, well, I should say testing out. There's, It's out there in, in certain it's places. There. Yeah, it's out there. Uh, but this is what we call variable primary, variable secondary. <laughs> Okay, I had to add the flow meters because they didn't show it, and it's really hard to, to show it. But but what happens is every chiller has a flow meter, okay? And okay, what, yeah. And, and we have a flow meter here on our secondary. Sure. So in the basics, just to make it real simple, is we want the primary flow to match, to match the secondary, the secondary. Sure. flow. Yeah. And what we do is these flow meters are used to tell us how much we're flowing through here so that we can add them all up and make sure that we're matching this. But it also is there so that we make sure that we get the minimum flow going through the chillers. And if we're not getting minimum flow, we'll shut down a chiller so right. that we get to flow up on these three okay. and keep doing that. We're always trying to shut down chillers to match what the flow is going out to the space. So, you know, if we got a thousand out here and we got 500, 500, 500, 500, we got 2,000 going out, we'll say, hey, let's shut down two chillers, shut them off, and we'll run these two, and that'll match what we got here. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll put some variable speeds in here. That way we can turn it up or turn it down, and we can use that to be right on the money. I mean, yeah, just, absolutely. Just brings that, that staging of set point real close. Yeah, let that, let that modulate up and down, and then we get to 80% on that variable speed, then what we'll do is we'll say, okay, let's go ahead and start this chiller up. When that chiller starts up, this one will start backing down. Yeah. And we'll get closer to closer to our things. But uh, this has a little bit more complicated controls, but it's very, very energy efficient. Yeah, very. I can see that. Yeah. Which is what and, we're going to. We're going to see more of this. Yeah, oh, a lot more. And and I know that there are uh, you know techs that I've worked with and still work with that work for our service area and uh, and they're seeing this more frequent more frequent out in the field yeah sure so i i do i wanted to tag something to my last statement because it just popped in my head and that is i mentioned that a reason for preventing or a reason to make sure we're staying above minimum flow is that flow switch is going to kick off i am i just want to put it out there absolutely do not ever jump out some a safety a flow switch is a safety mm -hmm. device it is there to protect a very very expensive machine <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is supposed to last for a very long time right absolutely and so i just wanted i mentioned the flow switch and some people may think well then i'll just jump out the flow switch what well, that is an absolute no do not ever jump a safety device out. And I want you to make sure that everyone understands that a flow switch is a safety device. Yeah. For absolutely. that equipment. Makes sense. Sorry, okay. Tom. I just felt oh, like no. maybe I put my foot in my mouth when I mentioned it without explaining that. No, because this equipment's expensive. I mean, I, I tell you, I mean, you know, it's 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 a lot of copper, it's a lot of stuff. So 
the price can get up there. I, I've seen them between four hundred thousand up to uh, you know over a million dollars. Oh so yeah, absolutely. They're very very expensive piece of equipment. So and they last you know twenty five thirty years um, or oh, longer with, with good maintenance. Yeah, properly yeah that's what I was going to say. Yeah. If they're taken care of, they'll last a lot longer. Uh, one other thing too on this one. Notice variable primary. We still have that decoupler loop. The decoupler loops there just in case. Just as a safety. Just as a safety in case something sure. goes wrong. Yeah, we get a pump stuck, then we at least have some velocity control. Now, this next slide, it, it is very busy, but it's out there. This one here is a variable primary. Okay. Variable secondary. Variable condenser. That's a lot of controls, Tom. So now we're trying to really save a bunch of energy. Notice we have three chillers. Mm-hmm. But we have four primary pumps, so that means we have an N1. So we have a we have a standby pump. Okay. Then we have our three chillers. They're all variable speed chillers. Okay. And then over here on the condenser side, we have four condenser pumps, meaning that we have one N1, uh, a backup. And what we're doing here is we're doing the same thing. We're we're we got we're varying the water through here because we're going out to the system. So whatever the secondary needs, these primaries will speed up and slow down to maintain the secondary. Okay, and then the condenser side, what we're doing is instead of just running water through the condenser or the, the chiller and out to the towers and that stuff, we're, we're keeping trying to keep those condenser pumps below 80 percent. They save our energy savings, okay. but make sure that we're getting the right about a condenser water flow to the chillers. Right. OK, so if if we need to run, if one of these chillers is running full speed. I don't know why it would, but let's just say it is. Or maybe two are running full speed. You know, we might run three condenser pumps, but at a lower speed to save money. Makes sense. So we're energy. not starting and stopping the motors. We're keeping them maintained at a yeah, relatively keep them constant. Down, keep yeah. below that 80% and save yeah. that save that 41, 49% energy savings. Right. And then the same thing goes out here on the towers. Instead of saying, hey, we got two chillers running, we're running two towers, and those two towers are running full speed because they're trying to cool the air, we'll run two chillers with three towers. The towers are variable speed drives. Right. So th if we can get those down below 80%, we're saving money there. So in all things, we're all looking at where is the most efficient way to run the condenser water, the primary water, the secondary water, the chillers, and the cooling towers to keep that money savings down. A lot of controls goes in this, but once it's there and it's running, it will cut down on a lot of energy savings. Yeah, a lot yeah. of set points and programming I can see there, but yeah, the yeah. energy savings would be very significant. But it's just, yeah. in the way from a control point of view, I look at it as this is you know, four systems. I'm going to control the primary pumps. I'm going to control the secondary pumps. I'm going to control the condenser pumps. And I'm going to have a control loop to control the, the tower fans. And that, and you break it down in those four pieces and you work on those four pieces. And then it all comes together because the chillers will run off whatever loads coming into the, into the tail end of it. Yeah. So, so think about this. I've, uh, I'm an owner of a, um, 80 story building in New York city and maybe New York's not the good idea. Let's don't talk about New York. Let's talk about Atlanta and New York's got all so, kinds of regulations. Somewhere's got a big cooling load, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, New York's got a lot of regulations that, you know, interesting stuff to talk about. We can talk about that another time, mm -hmm. but I got this huge uh, 30, 40 uh, story building. You, when you talk about expenses to keep that building operating, the amount of electricity that it uses by far, the HVAC system, the cooling system, just the comfort cooling system is a significant amount of That's the energy consumption. That's why we keep having these discussions. Yeah, understanding what that energy that utilization is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's what I'm saying. Being able to balance this to the most absolute efficient operation, sequence of operation, whatever it may be, you want to call it, is so important when it's costing you $150,000, $200,000 a month <laughs> <That's right. laughs> for your electric For bill. utilities. Yeah, indeed. And, it, and it, it really is because when we do my GET students, I show them the kilowatts per ton for these chillers. And, you know, I show them one on a constant speed one. Then I take them to the variable speed ones. And the variable speed ones, I mean, you're looking at like, 0.27 kilowatts per ton where on a constant speed one you might be looking at 40 cents a uh, four uh, 40 uh, point four 0.4 kilowatts per ton right. and they think well that's not much it is when you're running these chill that's per ton right 
if you have exactly. a thousand ton chiller and you have and it's running 24 hours a day that's going to add up a lot yeah over time and the other thing too is another thing that really amazed me when i came to daikin is our chillers run with impellers that are only six eight or ten inches i think what do we go the highest is 12 12.6 inches is the, yep. is the largest and actually we do have one that we are working that's, on that's 16 inches but that's yeah. that's not out yet yeah but it, it's just they run on these small thing and they they run and they'll, they'll pull these tonnage where you go to other vendors and they're running much larger turbines 24 yeah. inch well, they have to be because we're geared drive instead of a, yep. a, a direct a direct drive. yeah exactly yeah. And so uh, there's another variable, though, in the, the construction of a chiller, because a an impeller that is, say, uh, so so our 86 compressors or our 79 compressors, that's a 7.9 inch impeller. So a 79 compressor with uh, geared a certain way will actually run more capacity than a 79 geared at a lower speed. So you know, that gearing and the ratio between the bull gear and the pinion gear is really, really important in how fast, because you're still trying to get to that, that 600 and I don't, I don't remember the exact number. It's over 600 feet per second tip speed, I think is what it is. Uh, and Tom, you would know that number off the top of your head. What's but, And what's the, the, the speed of these impellers are between 15,000 and 30,000 RPMs. I was getting ready to ask yep. that. Yep. yep. And, and that's it. We're, we're, we're speeding an impeller up to a really, really, really fast. Sure. Um, and if we want to take this to an even better, you know, right now with that comment about geared, that's just oiled centrifugals, right? Magnetics yep. are direct drive. So the magnetic, so an impeller inside of one of our WME compressors is spinning. So a 500 ton machine is probably spinning about 14 to 16,000 to to stay above that surge line. Okay. Uh times, but it's 16,000 RPMs direct drive. <laughs> That's a big deal. That's a huge yeah. difference. Right. Then it's having a standard motor motor that's 3200 geared. or 3600 RPM sure. motor that's geared that then is turning th uh 3600 RPMs into 30,000 yeah. RPMs. Wow. So, yeah. And the other thing, too, is like I said, we're trying to save energy here. We're trying to save money all the way around. Yeah. So even with these magnetic bearing chillers, you're not going to have to do any kind of oil. Yep, yeah. Can you oil. explain that a little bit? Because this is a fascinating philosophy that we are eventually, someday we'll see in residential and light commercial applications, but no time in the near future that I'm aware of. Uh, but it changes a lot. Changes friction. It changes. Just talk well, a little bit about that. The only friction going through that compressor is the refrigerant as it crap passes through the exactly. through the impeller and uh, and uh, around the pipes and whatever it is. B the The magnetic uh, now we have two. We actually have two. We have the WMC line. WMC itself is uh, leveraging the TurboCore compressor uh, as uh, a dual compressor unit. Yep. It goes up to four hundred tons, roughly. I think it's 400, might be a little bit more if you can squeeze it out of it. And then the WME line, which is both single and dual compressor, single will take you up to 750 tons. And then uh, when you go with dual, you actually get all the way up to 1,500 tons. Okay. Um, I've actually seen people testing, not necessarily here, but p testing even multiple more compressors. You know, you've got how many more compressors can we get on this thing? And how can we figure out how to make it all work? You know, um, right now, our, our dual compressor units are, are, are where we're sticking. But uh, um, it's it's the coolest technology. Yeah, it, it is. And, and the nice thing about it is that what I try to tell everybody is it's oilless. Where you have an oiled compressor, you're going to get oil degradation in the evaporator because the oil is floating through with the refrigerant. Right. Just like on a DX unit, it's floating through there. And it, it'll start... And it, building up, not a lot, but a little bit over time, over time. But on these magnetic bearing ones, there's no oil. Uh, they looked, they they just did a test the other day. They they took a, an oil and a, a Marig Mag bearing chiller 10 years ago, and they ran the numbers on it and checked it out. And then they went back 10 years later and looked at them, and the magnetic bearing had no uh, degradation in its efficiency whatsoever. Because yeah. there's no oil in that evaporator. Well, yeah. it also opens up the options for refrigerants, doesn't it, by not having the limitation of particular oils and oil migration? Yeah, I, I think there 
are always options and our engineering department does a really good job at weighing those and validating them on the test stand to make sure. Right. Yeah, I know that over in Europe, um, you know, even with turbo core compressors, we do have some uh, chillers that are being manufactured that are running something different than R134. Okay. So um, it, some of them, I, I, I can't remember. I just remember the color of the top of the compressor, even though it's a turbo core compressor is green instead of uh, hmm. uh you know, black like we have on ours. Okay. Um, I don't know who makes it, but uh, yeah, that and it also reduces your maintenance. Yeah. Absolutely. So, example on an oil centrifugal, I would always, as a service manager, recommend to my customer that we do an oil analysis, analysis at least once anyhow. a year yeah. to to look for metals, and then we do that every year to just because again, these units run for thirty years to see deterioration over time if we don't have an oil test at the beginning of the life of the chiller. How are we going to know that the oil test 15 years later is actually showing something? So we do that every year, along with the same idea of doing eddy current tests, you know, on your tubes, uh, you, I would always call for an eddy current, but if you do, you know, if the chiller is five years old, yes, get an eddy current done. If you didn't get it done when, when the, it started up, you know, get an eddy current done at year one and then do it, every five years after that to make sure that the the copper tubes are still because refrigerant is a solvent absolutely and 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 it's not only refrigerant as a, a liquid and as a solvent but it's also refrigerant under pressure sense. yeah and so when you apply a mechanical force with a solvent you can deteriorate copper over a period of time now life cycle expectation on this equipment per uh, ashray i believe is about 23 years 25 years i don't know the exact number you probably would tell me you could tell me even better i know 23 is what it used to be um but if you can get 40 out of years out of a unit and you're saving a million bucks in energy cost every year by year three the chiller year four year five the chiller it's all free money yeah not crazy so and one other thing, just to throw in, I don't mean yeah. anything, but this is pretty neat technology. You're, you're asking about technology. Yep. With the variable, with the magnetic bearing drives and all that stuff, what we have now is we have a thing called ride-through technology. Yeah. Where that. if we have a power failure and it's less than 17 seconds long, still spinning. the VFD will catch up and just resynchronize and, <laughs> and run right back on. That's you don't have crazy. to worry about the chiller going all the way down and then restarting. Right, and restarting it. from ground zero. And then if we, if we goes past, if it's, if the power's off for more than 20 seconds, and then what we can do is we can get up to 80% on the chiller within 75 seconds after, after wow. power's restored. Yeah. So, yeah, so with that magnetic bearing, it really helps us out on those restores. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it also changes the way you look at starts and run hours. Yeah. Um, because there's no oil, it's refrigerant cooled. So cooling the components within the compressor itself is, it's, it's mostly about keeping the motor and the, keeping the electronics cool. Yeah, absolutely. So, since we're not having to remove we're not cooling heat. bearings anymore from we're not cooling bearings we're not yeah. cooling bearings right yeah. so way more efficient better operating longer life um you know, again magnetic compressor is great dirty tubes is going to cause a problem with no matter what chiller you got and if your magnetic compressor is not going to be efficient and it could put it in a place where it's trying to run outside of the envelope and that can cause damage. So, but no, yeah, it's, it's, it's great technology. We've been doing magnetic chillers since the uh, mid nineties. Yeah. I've seen that. Um, and what he talked about ride through, Yeah, you know, it, where would that be important? Well, I can think of a few things like uh, a data center. Yeah, because, someplace that needs, as soon as that equipment comes back up online, boy, you are got to be right. cooling in a hurry. Yeah, yeah, servers need to be cooled. And those are just one application, multiple applications, multiple customer types or profiles that 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 return to full load or that return to whatever load is the building is in is, is really important. Absolutely. Great opportunity for some questions. Uh, we still have quite a few people out here on the chat. Anybody have things that they'd like clarified? Well, let's do some resources too. Let me drag this out here so we make sure that we know how to contact Daikin for some further information. So mm -hmm. you guys have a lot of training classes. A lot of people don't realize how many training opportunities. You mentioned that you had some instructor-led online. You have some self-paced online. 
and you have some hands on at multiple facilities. So mm -hmm. what is the best way to contact you guys for the classes? So, so the best way really to contact us for the class, first off, what I would do is go out to our website. And if you go out to dykeitapply.com, at the top of your menu is a little tab that says training. When you yep. click that training, there are uh, three tiles that show up. One of those is our training. Our training will show you our schedule and all of that's coming up. It'll also provide you with a link where you can register that will actually open a form and provide you with all the instructions you need on how do you get enrolled. If you want to see the training at a, a, a kind of a little bigger picture with more detail, yep. and, you know, including the learning objectives that you're going to actually uh, accomplish while you're there. And you, I would go ahead and, and just above that, um, our I think once you click our training just above that one, you'll see it says training catalog. It actually says, I think, 23, 24 training catalog. That is a 60 page book that not only describes every training course that we do, the learning objectives associated with it, but also introduces all the instructors, tells you where we're at, tell, gives you all the terms and conditions around training. Even we'll even come out to your location and schedule training with enough notice and send an instructor out to do training for a group uh, of people that you have. And, and reach out to Daikin Learning at daikinapplied.com. And, and, and that's another great resource for finding out what's going on. I'd always start with the catalog, start with the website, figure out what it is you're looking for, what specific product you might want training on, or if you need industry training, our HVAC systems program is listed out there also. But your next step would then be to talk to uh, Daikin Learning. And Daikin Learning can be reached at Daikin Learning at DaikinApplied.com. All right. Fantastic, guys. I haven't seen any other messages pop up. Any last things that we want to add before we hop off here today? I really appreciate you guys hanging out with us and diving into chillers today. It's been great. No, I think it's been great. And, and here's what I can say. Way back when I took this job, because this is an awesome industry to work in. Yeah, it's and been great for me. It's opened up a lot of opportunities. I want to express to you guys my appreciation for what you do, because I, I'm I'm serious. There's not enough visibility. We, we want if we want to lead in education, we have to be visible yep. in education. And so my biggest ask for your audience is that if you learn something today, share it with somebody else. All right, Adrian, uh, good info. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you joining us as well. Winder out there, a bunch of people uh, really appreciating the topics today. We thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, come around, guys. Hang in uh, anytime. We have plenty of topics we can talk about. We have people that we want to get connected to you in the industry. And for those out there in the audience, we look forward to seeing you again next week on Did You Know the ESCO HVAC Show? Everyone have a fantastic evening, and we'll see you on the next round. Thanks, guys.